Hi, today we're going to be talking about section 1.5, the origin of cells. So some of the things that you need to know are that cells can be formed by the division of pre-existing cells, like we saw with the cell theory. Okay, the first cells must have arisen from non-living material, and the origin of eukaryotic cells can be explained by the endosymbiotic theory. So cell theory, as you recall, one of the fundamental kind of uh, pieces of that is that all cells come from pre-existing cells. And with that, um, once the first cell kind of came into existence, so to speak, once the evolution had provided us with cells, now all cells are coming from pre-existing cells. So there may have been, um, from like a TOK standpoint, there may have been one point in time when cell theory was kind of violated in that um, we had inanimate matter that became a cell. But <clears throat> as far as cell theory goes in, in, in this module here with the origin of cells, we're going to concentrate on all cells coming from pre-existing cells. And one of the things to remember is that when a, uh, a cell's surface area to volume ratio becomes too small, um, the cell is getting too large, it can't manage its uh, metabolism very well, then it needs to divide. <clears throat> and it does so by, you know, some of the methods that we talked about, either binary fission with bacteria or just through mitosis with um, eukaryotic cells. So um, in the uh, 19th century, Louis Pasteur was able to disprove the notion of spontaneous generation, which is uh, what was um, believed by many commoners and uh, wasn't disproven until he did some of his uh, famous experiments showing that uh, um, you needed a contamination. Uh, somehow a cell had to get in and contaminate the um, uh, you know, sterilized material in order to make it uh, um, you know, start growing uh, bacteria, it didn't just spontaneously do so. So there was a lot of famous experiments that were done um, during this time just to show that all cells are coming from pre-existing cells. But before we got there, once we had these first cells that we were talking about, there was a lot of evidence now that's based on the idea of how these first cells came into existence and that there must have somehow been some primordial soup that was um, proposed by um, J.B.S. Haldane and, and Oprin and their uh, ideas of, of what the primitive atmosphere was like and things like that. And um, this 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 primordial soup led to the abiotic synthesis of a lot of these small organic molecules, these things that could join into these um, complex polymers and give rise to substances that could ultimately form membranes and, and, and uh, start to entrap some of the things in the surroundings and maintain a chemistry on the inside that's a little different than that on the outside, which would be one of the hallmarks of a living organism in a cell. And these primitive cells that were able to do this are referred to as protobionts. And the origin of these self-replicating molecules as time went on, we're talking about immense uh, periods of time here, billions of years as this was happening, um, this was what was giving rise to um, these first protobionts or these primitive cells here. So there's a lot of experimental support um, kind of showing how abiotic synthesis of um, you know, living material, things that uh, became uh, um, uh, incorporated into biological organisms. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the protobiont experiments with a, a researcher at Harvard University here in the United States, um, Jack Shawstack, and then the Miller-Urey experiment that was done at the University of Chicago in the 1950s, um, and then uh, the notion of panspermia and how that could be uh, viewed as a way um, from a scientific standpoint, <clears throat> a, a way in which we could have given rise to um, biological types of compounds here on our planet. So with uh, protobionts, what these are are basically um, aggregates of abiotically synthesized molecules surrounded, surrounded by a, a simple membrane. And they exhibit some of the uh, key properties associated with life. They can reproduce themselves, as you can kind of see here uh, in this diagram right here. This is giving rise to... Um, more protobionts, just a simple membrane with an internal chemistry that's different than the external chemistry, which is um, what we refer to as uh, um, a metabolism necessarily. And then um, Jack Shostak, as I said, was, is a researcher who's done a lot of experiments with this. And he's shown that uh, if fatty acids are present in the environment, they can kind of self-assemble and form different structures, some of which are, um, have membranes and have these lipid bilayers like we learned about earlier on. And these membranes <clears throat> can surround the uh, macromolecules in the environment and give rise to um, structures that have many lifelike types of properties. And um, as time went on, these protobionts would have given rise to, um, you know, uh, more and more complexity and ultimately giving rise to what could be um, considered a cell.
Now with the miller Airy experiment, uh, what these two were doing was they were taking um, Oprin and Haldane's kind of hypothesis of the uh, primitive soup and the primitive atmosphere, <clears throat> and they were locking it in this sterilized glassware here, and they were providing a spark that could have come from um, static electricity, things like that in the atmosphere as the volcanoes erupted, etc. And um, you can see here, here's uh, um, Stanley Miller with his, his apparatus here, and this is, uh, you know, contains the primitive atmosphere, here's the spark, and then this is the solution that's being heated and bubbled through here. And what he found when he analyzed the uh, solution after it had, uh, the experiment had gone to completion was a lot of different types of biological compounds, including, including many different amino acids. And the important thing to know here is that he didn't show that life arose like this, but the um, possibility of life and the materials that are required for life were found in, in the solution that he was able to analyze. So that's the important distinction there is he didn't produce any living organisms or any, any living compounds, but he produced a lot of the precursors um, to these types of things. Now, if we talk about the idea of panspermia, it seems kind of crazy to think that, you know, the, the planet could have been seeded by uh, compounds from outer space that could have given rise to uh, living types of organisms. But um, this uh, contamination that you see uh, when people, um, astrobiologists and such, are, are examining uh, meteorites and things like that, they find that there's a, a, a lot of these, as you see in here, a lot of biological types of compounds, a lot of compounds that are just present in these things when they analyze them that uh, um, could have seeded the planet with the necessary types of things for these cells, these protobionts, these organisms to kind of come into being. And it doesn't necessarily explain the origin of life, but what it does is, is it explains that there are certain compounds that may have been synthesized and seeded the planet, um, giving rise to uh, um, protobionts with increased complexity and, and leading to um, ultimately the first cell. And some of the experimental evidence, for instance, with this one, um, when they examined the meteorite samples, they found that there is a lot of different types of biological compounds, such as the L and D uh, dopa forms of these amino acids. And the important thing to know is if these were contamination from living organisms, you would find only this L form here because the, the living organisms only synthesize the L form. But the, um, the other isomer, the D form, was also found uh, in this, which would indicate that it's not a contamination and that it was probably synthesized abiotically somewhere in the universe and found its way, um, you know, incorporated its way into this meteorite and uh, was analyzed and found to be there. So it's very interesting to, to think about, um, you know, but there's, there's all sorts of scientific explanations for um, um, the origin of life and the origin of these biological compounds. So now if we go to endosymbiosis and start talking about how these cells kind of increased in complexity after the first bacterial cells uh, um, arised and, you know, lived for uh, a couple of billion years. And endosymbiosis basically is the, the increased complexity of these cells. So you can say that you can see here you start with two independent bacteria. And one, this green one here, is a heterotrophic bacteria, and it takes in this, this purple um, bacterium. And then eventually, through time, what's happening is, is it ends up um, being undigested and they form a symbiotic type of relationship. And uh, mitochondria and plastids are examples of endosymbiosis and how this um, occurred. And a lady named Lynn Margulis was one who uh, she teaches at the University of Massachusetts here in the United States. And she really um, did a lot of experimental evidence uh, or experimentation uh, on this uh, hypothesis and found a lot of evidence in support of that. Because as this cell starts to then grow and divide, the cell inside of it is too. And eventually through time, they lose kind of uh, certain functions that were unique to them in the very beginning and then they become kind of dependent on one another. So what the, the theory proposes, for instance, here is with uh, mitochondria and prokaryotes were once formerly small bacterial free-living organisms that um, kind of associated with each other, as I uh, mentioned a second ago. And um, the proposed ancestors of these mitochondria were aerobic prokaryotic heterotrophs, and the proposed uh, plastids were photosynthetic uh, uh, bacteria. And they worked out this association kind of with one another um, and kind of 
were giving each other um, some of the things that they needed. And some of the benefits to this is pretty easy to consider when you consider that the environment was changing a lot because um, these photosynthetic types of, of endosymbionts were able to use light energy to um, create carbohydrates and things like that that the heterotroph could benefit from. And in addition to that, the, um, the anaerobic cell is associating itself with um, a, a bacterial cell that has the ability to use oxygen, for instance, with mitochondria, to generate ATP. So uh, oxygen was accumulating in the atmosphere in the, the oceans at, at the time, and it's a toxic uh, um, compound to anaerobic types of bacteria. So any bacterium that could associate itself with another one that has the ability to use this oxygen they both gain a survival advantage. One is hidden from prey, and it has a, a ready source of nutrients. The other one is um, kind of shielded from or, or um, protected from the harmful effects of oxygen. <clears throat> so some of the evidence that supports this theory of endosymbiosis. If you look at the inner membranes of the plastids and the mitochondria, you find that they both have enzymes and transport proteins that are homologous to or very similar, if not exactly, like those found in living prokaryotes. And the mitochondria and plastids have self-replication process, very similar to binary fission, which is how bacteria um, divide and grow, the ones uh, alive today. Um, each of these organelles has their own single circular piece of DNA just like that which is found in a bacterium, the single circular piece of DNA, and it has the ability to self-replicate and things like that. <clears throat> both of these organelles contain their own ribosomes and both of them are very similar to the bacterial ribosomes, the 70S ones that we talked about in an earlier module, and these mitochondrian plastids are about the same size as the prokaryotes. So there's a lot of evidence that I listed here as well as much more evidence that supports the theory of endosymbiosis, which is how uh, multicellular um, organelle or multi, excuse me, multicellular organisms came into being and just as importantly as uh, the existence of eukaryotic cells with uh, many different types of organelles that are inside of them. So I hope you found this uh, um, useful and good luck.